Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about mergers, in the sense of companies or entities combining into a singular entity. In the world of business, this can be done for a great many reasons. On the more mutual and ideal side, it can be done for each initial entity to better itself, increase its customer base, gain access to new markets, have greater logistical support, etc. On the less ideal and more predatory side, it can be done to eliminate competition and create quasi-monopolies. Now, I'm no economics expert, so I'll skip past things like the effects of mergers on markets and whatnot, mainly because I don't really care about that right now. The thing I care about in today's context is the historic merger of two companies back in 1943, the merger of Consolidated Aircraft with Volte Aircraft to form Consolidated Volte, later simplified to just Convair. Now, if there are any ulterior or nefarious motives for this merger, I don't really know. The gist of the story is that Volte's parent company, Avco, would purchase about 33% of Consolidated in late 1941, after the founder of Consolidated, Reuben Fleet, elected to sell most of his shares in the company in an apparent move towards his retirement. Consolidated was far and away the more successful company at that point, but Avco had the capital, and Fleet was willing to sell. So Avco would purchase his shares with the intent of merging Consolidated with their company, Volte despite the resulting company not being all that prevalent in the Second World War, they didn't have much of a chance after all, they formed in 1943, and aircraft production takes a little while, they would have the opportunity to create a first for American aviation, with a little merger of sorts of their own. Not a merger of companies, but a merger of technology merger of jet engine technology with piston engine propeller technology. This is the first American flown turboprop aircraft. This is the Consolidated Volte XP-81. In 1943, while the whole merger situation was going on with Consolidated Volte, the U.S. Army Air Force was searching for an aircraft that many a nation at the time were looking for a long-range escort fighter. This is something that I've gone over a few times before, but as a reminder, the problem with a lot of early escort fighters is that the bigger ones that had the fuel capacity necessary struggled in combat against smaller aircraft, while the smaller, more agile fighters lack the fuel capacity necessary for extended escort missions. This made many a country search for a plane that could really hit the sweet spot in between the two situations. One that could hold up in a fight, and actually make it to that fight in the first place. So, in mid-1943, the USAAF invited new designs that needed, among other factors, a 1,250-mile range, a max speed over 500 miles an hour, a climb rate of 2,500 feet per minute, and, not required but recommended, a dual-engine design that used both a propeller engine and a jet engine. Now, in 1943, jet engines were still in their relative infancy, but the speed potential they offered was incredibly enticing. However, they wouldn't ask for a design with just a jet engine alone, because these early jet engines were rather lacking in both acceleration and fuel efficiency, in that they consumed way too much fuel, and certainly would not be fit for escort duty at this stage. Rather, the jet engine would be used in emergency and combat situations, where an extra burst of speed was needed. Still, because of the sheer power that was offered by jets and turbine engines in general, an in-between of piston prop engines and jet engines was sought in the form of the turboprop engine. 
unlike your typical jet engine where the exhaust of the turbine is the main source of thrust, in a turboprop that turbine would drive a standard propeller that provided the majority of the thrust, along with the exhaust providing a lesser amount, probably around 10 to 15 percent. These turboprops would be much more fuel efficient than your typical jet engine, while also offering much more power than your typical piston engine. The major downside is that it doesn't offer the same top speed as a jet, as the propellers inherently caused more drag. But for 1943, a super-powered propeller aircraft was an ideal goal to reach for. Consolidated vault wouldn't have that much choice in the turboprop engine they used, and would go with the General Electric TG-100, the first turboprop engine designed and built by the United States. At this point, the engine was merely experimental, but it was basically the only choice they had. Its projected horsepower was relatively impressive for its size. At 2,300 horsepower, for an engine that weighed in total around 2,000 pounds. For the jet thruster, they would go with the Allison J33 GE5. With around 3,750 foot-pounds of thrust to its name, the USAAF would place an order for two prototype aircraft on February 11, 1944, and the design would be given the designation of XP-81. Shortly afterward, as the design and construction was still ongoing, the USAAF would add to their order an additional 13 aircraft, these to be dubbed the YP-81. The main difference between these and the original design would be the TG-100 turboprop engine swapped out for an improved TG-110 engine, an engine that didn't actually exist at this point. By February 11, 1945, exactly one year after the order was placed, the first XP-81 was ready to fly. Measuring in at 13.61 meters long, 15.39 meters wide, and 4.11 meters tall, the general body design looked largely similar to an earlier Volte project, the XA-41. The wings had this sort of illusion of being forward swept, having the leading edge be just about perpendicular to the fuselage and the trailing edge be angled. The more standout aspect of the body design, though, would be the air intakes for the jet engine mounted on the tail. The intakes would be double barreled, one on each side of the fuselage, sitting around the midpoint of the top of the fuselage. For the turboprop engine in the nose, its air intake would be effectively hidden around the propeller shaft, and the exhaust would be under the fuselage below the cockpit. The overall weight of the plane would sit at just under 13,000 pounds empty. On the day that the XP-81 was ready to fly, though, the turboprop was not ready, and actually wouldn't be for about a year. In the meantime, they needed some kind of replacement that could be used to test how the frame handled, how it functioned aerodynamically. For its replacement, they would pull from the famous P-51D Mustang the engine that helped put it on the map, the Packard V-1650, also known as the Rolls-Royce Merlin. This engine had significantly less horsepower than the turboprop was projected to have, but with a weight of around 1,600 pounds, and with around 1,400 horsepower, it was good enough for the time being. Some alterations would have to be done to the XP-81's nose to fit this engine, and the nose was altered to have a more open air intake for the radiator. Adding this radiator and constituent components would add nearly a thousand pounds to its weight. Fortunately for the weight, though, there was no armament installed at this time, so that probably helped to balance things out. When the XP-81 took to the air with this replacement engine, the results were a bit mixed, but still promising overall. The plane handled quite well overall, 
but it did have poor directional stability at lower speeds. This problem was a relatively easy fix though, with the vertical tail fin being extended by about 15 inches, and a ventral fin was added underneath. After about 10 total flight hours, the XP-81 was brought back to the Volte factory to be fitted with the TG-100 turboprop. In the meantime though, the project as a whole would suffer a major blow due to American progress in the Pacific. Because America captured islands close to Japan, the islands of Guam and Saipan, the need for new long-range escort fighters was significantly reduced. Of course, by this time as well, the P-51D had shown itself to be an incredibly solid escort fighter, with just a normal piston engine and some drop tanks. This likely led to the cancellation of the 13 YP-81 frames, but the two initial prototypes were allowed to continue. The project would suffer yet another blow after Japan surrendered shortly after, meaning that the military would be less interested in new designs as a whole, there wasn't a war to fight now, so they could take things a bit slower. The XP-81 would eventually have the turboprop installed and ready to fly on December 21st, 1945, the first day of winter. How festive. But there is one question, though. Why did it take them so long to install the turboprop engine? Well, even though they were installing it, and it was ready on December 21st, 1945, it wasn't exactly ready to use. The TG-100 was still incredibly finicky, and before the XP-81 took to the air, they had to make sure it actually functioned. It ended up taking about six months to work out all the kinks, and even then, they didn't really work out all of them. The engine's turbines were very fragile, the oil cooler was insufficient, and there was a significant lag issue. You know how when you're playing a video game and you press a button and it takes a few seconds for it to actually register? Now, imagine that issue, but instead of it being a game, it's, I don't know, your car. Imagine it took your car several seconds to register that you hit the accelerator or the brake the TG-100 engine was having that problem. So when the new and improved XP-81 took to the air on December 21st, likely because of all the issues that the engine was having prior, its maiden flight wasn't much of one, lasting a grand total of just five minutes. Luckily though, everything went okay, and the engine survived without any apparent major issues apart from the oil consumption being notably high. After this flight, the TG-100 engine would be removed for about two weeks, just to check for damage and potential oil leaks, which resulted in the changing out of some gaskets and an oil pump regulator. For the next year or so, deep into 1946, the XP-81 would undergo dozens of test flights to rather mixed results. On the more positive side, the handling was still quite good. The rate of climb would be well above the initially requested 2,500 feet per minute at around 5,200 feet per minute, and the maximum achieved speed would go above the requested 500 miles an hour, reportedly achieving a top speed of 546 miles an hour in September 1946. On the negative side of things though, both the TG-100 turboprop and the J-33 jet engine experienced problems in their power output and overall durability. On the turboprop, there were consistent issues with excessive propeller vibration, although this would be reduced through the addition of weights to the propeller reduced but not remedied. Additionally, the engine turbine would have to be replaced at least twice in this span, at least once on the original engine, and at least once on a newly installed TG-100 after the original engine was replaced 
after another turbine failure. While these maintenance issues were certainly problematic, they really weren't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. The far bigger issue lie in the fact that the power output of the TG-100 was well below what was anticipated. Instead of getting around 2300 horsepower, they got somewhere between 1400 and 1600, on par with what the Merlin engine provided. If they would be having these mechanical issues, only to get an engine that was on par with something they already had in spades, then really what would be the point? For the jet engine, there were fewer issues overall, but it would be a somewhat similar story. Issues experienced included the tail cone becoming loose mid-flight after several bolts loosened, the fuel pressure would suddenly drop, resulting in a drop in power output, and most critically, the actual power output was less than what was expected. While not as significant a decrease as the TG-100, the drop from 3,750 foot-pounds down to 3,500 was certainly still a problem. Because of these mechanical issues and overall disappointing performance, disappointing in what was projected versus the reality of the situation, the USAAF's interest in the design began to wane leaving Convair to scramble to try and reignite their interest. In December 1946, they would propose that the TG-100 be replaced with the TG-110, and the J-33 to be replaced with an upgraded variant. Seemingly confident that the XP-81 project would be allowed to continue, the next month on January 14, 1947, Convair sought to test out, among other things, its proposed armament. To be tested would be six 50 caliber machine guns or six 20 millimeter cannons, along with a 3,200 pound bomb load on two underwing pylons. These pylons could also be configured to fit depth charges, drop tanks, and or rockets. However, probably because the XP-81 was already underperforming, the USAAF didn't buy into these proposed improvements, and on May 9th, 1947, the contract for the XP-81 was cancelled. I should also note that a few sources say that the YP-81 frames were actually cancelled around this time as well, just in late January, and not in mid-1945, so the YP-81 was either cancelled in mid-1945 or early 1947. Quite a gap in dates there. But after their cancellation, the two functioning XP-81 aircraft would be transferred over to the Air Corps, likely to serve as reserve aircraft. The two aircraft would nearly experience a little bit of a revival in 1948-49 after it was proposed that they be used as test beds for jet engines and turbine engines in general. However, this plan never came to fruition, and the two frames would then be stripped of all their useful parts and resources in April 1949 before being moved to an effective plane graveyard to serve as potential bombing and reconnaissance testing targets. After sitting outside in the desert for nearly 50 years, the frames would be recovered in 1994 and be sent over to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force to be restored. 29 years later, these two frames still sit in storage in basically the exact same condition, perhaps a bit less dusty, waiting for that project to finally begin. As for the engines used on the XP-81, the TG-100, later renamed the T-31, would never manage to solve the issues that it had, and a grand total of just 28 of them would be made. The proposed upgrade, the TG-110, would never be made. The information gained and the lessons learned from this would help advance turboprop engines in the future, though. 
resulting in designs like the Allison T56 that still sees use even today. As for the J33 engine, aside from seeing use in early American jet aircraft like the P-80 and the F-94, the more interesting thing to me anyway that they were used for was testing of aircraft carrier arresting cables and tail hooks. The engines would be installed in these ultra-wide car things and used to launch aircraft and test arresting cable deceleration capabilities. I really just wanted to mention this because I saw what the cars looked like, and they looked really stupid, and I love them. But back to the XP-81, I think the biggest thing to take away from it is that technological advancement can be rather rough. New technology has a learning curve to it. It's new technology, after all. Still, even though the XP-81 ended up being a disappointment, honestly, it kind of sucked compared to what was promised, that failure was a learning experience, and one way or another, it became part of the development process that led to planes like the C-130 and V-22 Osprey flying with turboprops. So the concept overall ended up being kind of a success. Although the V-22 has had a lot of problems and is very controversial, so maybe the issues of the XP-81 are in its genes. But anyway though, with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. When I first saw the XP-81, I thought it looked like a plane that would be like a special unlock in a video game. Like a fictitious design that would have this weird backstory of being made by a mad genius, combining old school and new school. Somebody should put this plane in a game. I want to play it. But... Anyway, though, this video, I believe, is coming out the day after Christmas, so I hope you had a great holiday, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!